Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, I'm Kevin Banks, and I'm the policy director of the Open Technology Institute New America Foundation. Um, and there are a few things I could say with a minute or two that I have right now. I could thank you all for coming and thank the Reporters Committee uh, for Freedom of the Press, Freedom of the Press Foundation, the staff of New America's OTI, uh, who helped make this event happen. Uh, with the support of the Knight Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundations, and Participant Media. Uh, and I guess I did just say that. Um, or I could thank the journalists in the room, without whom uh, we wouldn't have any idea what the heck the government is doing, uh, and I and the other policy advocates in the room wouldn't be able to do our jobs. I, I could say that, and I guess I just did. I could talk about how what the NSA is doing threatens the fourth estate. Uh, which was the subject of a great paper by our friends at Human Rights Watch this summer called uh, With Liberty to Monitor All. That paper came out the same week as uh, our at OTI's paper, Surveillance Costs, about the costs of what the NSA is doing to our economy, to internet freedom, to the security of the internet itself. Uh, I could re recommend that you read both of those papers, and I suppose I just did that. Um, but what I really want to talk about in the minute I have left uh, is what I think is the second most valuable lesson we got from Edward Snowden, uh, beyond the facts revealed in the documents that he shared. And that lesson is that encryption, properly implemented, works. Which is why we're here today, uh, to make sure you have the tools and information necessary <clears throat> to secure your data, to protect your sources, to report the truth, and do it safely. Uh, encryption works, which is why we see it under attack. We've seen the NSA try to undermine encryption standards and insert back doors into secure products and services. Uh, that's one of the major subjects of our paper. Uh, and now we also see the Justice Department and the FBI attacking Apple and Google for giving us easy to use default encryption on their smartphones. Um, even going so far as to suggest that Congress should change the law to force hardware providers and online service providers to build back doors for law enforcement into their products. This very, well be, uh, uh, this very well may be our next big policy fight in the new Congress, which is a shame because I kind of thought we had won this fight back in the 90s uh, in the crypto wars. So encryption works unless the government breaks it. So I hope everybody here will pay close attention to that issue. If you haven't already, uh, one place you can start is by attending a debate on the issue that we're going to be holding at New America Monday after next, November 17th at 4 o'clock between uh, privacy scholar Peter Swire and former FBI general counsel Andrew Weissman. Um, so I could say all that, and I guess I just did. So all I have left to say is it's wonderful to see so many longtime and newfound friends and allies in the room today. I hope you have a fabulous time. Go forth and encrypt things. Hashtag encrypt news. Thanks. Hi, my name's Trevor Tim. I'm the director of Freedom of the Press Foundation, and I would just like to thank you all for coming. I'm uh, going to be very quick, uh, but I do think that this is actually one of the most important press freedom issues that's going to be facing us in the next decade, is how can journalists and sources secure their communications from the start of when they first meet, rather than uh, protecting them just years later in court. Uh, and you know, we have a fabulous uh, group of national security reporters and technologists today, and I really hope that uh, this conversation can create some ideas for how newsrooms, big organizations, can do things organization-wide uh, to better help reporters. You know, I think in the past year and a half, we've realized that there is this problem that we need to solve, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't fully figured out how to solve it. And um, it's going to take a lot of effort from a lot of different groups. And so hopefully today is the start of that conversation. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Bruce Brown from Reporters Committee. And we can get started. So. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Kevin. I just want to reiterate uh, all the thank yous uh, uh, that Kevin and Trevor have made. And here at the Reporters Committee, we are thrilled to be collaborating with, um, with these two organizations. Uh, bringing the worlds of journalism and technology together um, should really be and is one of the highest priorities of all of our organizations and uh, certainly now at the Reporters Committee. I want to thank our, our board chair, Pierre Thomas, um, for being here from ABC uh, News. I want to thank my law school friend, Alan Davidson, uh, New America and OTI, for, for helping make uh, this happen as well. Um, as I was walking over here today, I was thinking that when I was in college, um, the hottest thing coming out of Eastern Europe was Milan Kundera 
and uh, we all were uh, busy with our noses in the book of laughter and forgetting back there in the 1980s when he wrote that the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory versus forgetting. Um, and a generation later, the hottest thing out of Eastern Europe is Laura Portress. Um, and the set of issues are, are very different today than they were uh, a generation ago. And I think putting this conference together and these terrific panels uh, around her film uh, is something that we at the Reporters Committee are extremely proud of. Uh, and I, a final thank goes to Hannah Block Weba, who will be your moderator for the first panel, and I will turn this over to her. She has done a spectacular job making this event happen and uh, finding uh, the panelists and handling the logistics, and uh, we are all deeply indebted to you, Hannah, for this event. Thank you very much for being here. Is these on? Oh, yeah. Um, thanks again, at the risk of being redundant, everybody, for being here. Um, we're going to start off the first panel on um, real world encryption problems, which is, I hope, a sort of free ranging discussion about the practices that journalists are using um, to secure their communications with sources, how those have changed over time, and the kinds of threats that they're confronting um, now and how those have changed over time. So I'm going to, without further ado, introduce my panelists. Directly to my right is Chris Segoyan, who's the principal technologist and a senior policy analyst at the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. He's also a member of the Freedom of the Press Foundation's Technical Advisory Board. Um, he earned his PhD in computer science from Indiana University, which focused on the role that third-party service providers play in facilitating law enforcement surveillance of their customers, and was previously an Open Society Foundations Fellow and a TED Global Fellow. Um, to his right, we have Dana Priest, the John S. and James L. Knight Chair in Public Affairs Journalism at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, which is probably the award for longest title. Um, she's a veteran investigative reporter at the Washington Post, where she focuses on intelligence and counterterrorism. In 2006, Dana was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Beat Reporting for her reporting on CIA secret prisons, or black sites. She was also part of the Post team that won the 2008 Pulitzer for Public Service for reporting on the mistreatment of veterans at Walter Reed Hospital. She is the author of Top Secret America, The Rise of the New American Security State, and The Mission, Waging War and Keeping Peace with America's Military. To her right, we have Julia Angwin, who's a senior reporter at ProPublica, where she covers privacy and surveillance. Prior to joining ProPublica, Julia was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, where she led a privacy investigative team that was awarded a Gerald Loeb Prize in 2010 and was a finalist for the Pulitzer and Explanatory Reporting for 2011. She was also on a team of the reporters at the Journal that was awarded the 2003 Pulitzer and Explanatory Reporting for coverage of corporate corruption. She's the author of Stealing MySpace, The Battle to Control the Most Popular Website in America, as well as Dragnet Nation, A Quest for Privacy, Security, and Freedom in a World of Relentless Surveillance. And finally, we have Jim Risen, an investigative reporter at the New York Times. He's co-written several articles for the Times exposing warrantless domestic wiretapping, for which he and his co-author, Eric Lichtblau, won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting in 2006. James was also part of the New York Times team that won the 2002 Pulitzer for explanatory reporting for coverage of September 11th. He's been at the Times since 1998. Previously, he was a correspondent for the LA Times and is the author of several books, including State of War, The Secret History of the CIA and the Bush Administration, and Pay Any Price, Greed, Power, and Endless War. So I apologize for having to read those off this piece of paper, but there were too many prizes for me to keep straight otherwise. Um, and I wanted to start off by just asking for the journalists on the panel, um, what kinds of tools do you use to communicate with your sources? And has that changed at all for you in the last two years to five years as we've learned more 
about the scope and depth of national security surveillance. All three of you do extensive reporting on national security issues, often with anonymous sources. And how have the methods that you've used to communicate with them changed over time? Can I go first? Because I'm <clears throat> feeling very guilty being up here. I tried to explain when I was invited <laughs> that um, I'm a low-tech kind of reporter. Um, my view is, unless I was to really figure out how to use the most sophisticated encryption, uh, whatever I would use would be um, susceptible, and that my sources wouldn't, and that my sources would feel very uncomfortable anyway communicating with me electronically. So I'm not. I haven't. I've done a couple stories with huge caches of documents, but they haven't been in the classified arena, and so most, I'm a human source kind of person, and I believe that that is where most of the good journalism gets done, because place, uh, instances like the Snowden documents are rare, and that whatever you learn here, that will be great, I'm sure, and I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that this is not a great um, topic, but I want to be the cautionary one to say don't overuse technology. I already think that you know the younger generation of reporters has a tendency because it's more comfortable to talk with people electronically and that's just not how sensitive sources are going to trust you. Even in the Snowden case, you know, if you saw Citizen 4, you know, they spent a lot of time with him um, personally and they did that in a very careful way. So my best practices that have probably changed a little after um, the revelations or in the last several years have been just to increase the care with which I, you know, the care that I take when I deal face to face with people um, in terms of location and time and space in between and finding people and how that works. Um, if you put yourself in your sources, shoes, you know, why would they, reading all that they read, trust even simple encryption? You know, I, and luckily the Post has done some things recently that uh, help me um, and help my files and all that, but I just uh, want to make sure that nobody thinks that electronic communications and encrypting even should replace uh, really face-to-face -face and carefully thought out meetings with people. Uh, and so, there, now I don't feel so guilty. <laughs> I said it. I mean, I would, I'm a tech reporter. Sort of initially, I grew into privacy and surveillance from being a tech reporter. So I have always probably been on the leading edge of using these kinds of tools. And by the leading edge, I mean I'm really bad at it. And I, um, but I try. You know, I try relentlessly, and I call Chris for advice like every five minutes. And then, um, but you know. I would say the tools I use are the standard ones, which is I use off the record instant messaging, which is a, like probably one of the easiest things to use. Um, and if somebody else has um, any instant messaging program, it's pretty easy to explain to them how to use that and just pr press the little lock button. And that way you can feel that some of your communications are secure. Same thing with PGP, which I use for email quite a bit. Um, I was just sitting there getting an email on my phone. I was like, oh, PGP, I can't read it. I have to go to my computer and do that later. Um, so these tools are also inconvenient. That's another point. Um, but, and then I use Tails for things that are really, um, you know, where I wrote a lot of anonymity in Tails. I'm sure we'll talk about it more today, but it's obviously just a, it's a bootable operating system. So you have it on a thumb drive, you stick it in a computer, and it makes basically a fresh, um, experience for you so that even if that computer, um, it, you, you can feel safe that you're not, your operating system itself isn't sort of working against you, hopefully. Um, and the problem is though that all of these tools are hard to use and it's also really hard to get sources to use them. So, you know, <laughs> I always joke that the most of the people I talk to on encrypted channels are 
cryptographers, <laughs> right? I'm like, they're already, like, it's like we're in encrypted chats talking about encryption. <laughs> and that's awesome, but it's not actually, like, most of the real sources, like Dan Dana says, is basically you have to meet in person. And my experience is that in particularly actually in government, um, in the federal government, in people who are really in the intelligence industry, they don't even want to install an encryption program because it is a red flag, right? So I will ask people all the time, we would like to install this thing, it's super easy, it's an app, you put it on your phone, we can just talk on the phone, and they're like, no, if that's on there, that like, makes me look suspicious. So, um, so in those cases, actually, what I find works more often is, okay, well then let's establish our cover story. What are we meeting for? And that's really a better way, because we're going to have plain text traffic, so it's going to be about a different story. And, you know, that's not going to work, Jim can tell you. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> well, I agree with Dana. Um, I'm uh, kind of old school. Uh, and um, I would just add to both to, you know, but I agree with everybody here. I mean, there's a, you got to have a mix of things. I've tried just about everything. Um, the one thing I would add is uh, kind of echoing what they both said was that um, if you're trying to develop a source and you, you know, one of the, and if you say, you know, it would really be good to have encrypted conversations because what we're going to do is very dangerous to you, <laughs> that's not very good advertising. And um, so that's one of the problems. How do you um, how do you transition from developing a source to developing a source who's, who understands that it would be a good idea to use encrypted conversations? Um, and that's not an easy conversation to have. It's kind of like telling somebody you have cancer. You know, it it would be really important for you to use encrypted conversations with me because what you're doing is dangerous to your future. That's that's awkward. Um, and um, so it's, it's uh, really kind of sucks because it's, there's no easy way to decide how to, how to do any of this. Um, I've tried, as I said, I've tried various things. Um, sometimes it works. Sometimes it's just too much of a pain in the ass. Uh, and, um, but in, in the end, the best thing to do is just meet people in person and um, and try to uh, just not leave a, any kind of a trail um, as much as possible. Um, so, one thing I want to say about what you were talking about, which is this t asking someone to encrypt and saying this is going to be dangerous for you. So the line that I that I often use is that it's sort of like asking for sex on the first date. <laughs> it's like. Uh, we just met, and you asked me this innocuous question about some boring thing that you claimed you were doing a story about. Now you're asking me to do right. encryption? Like, that's a lot on the first date. Right. And the problem is that um, if you ask for it on the fourth date, it's too late, right? There's already a digital trail. So it's a problem for journalists. Well, before we leave the, leave the discussion here, you know, just one other thing, which is... Uh, is just to think carefully about what you put on email. You know, you, you were talking about a cover story, but you know, I think of it as <coughs> much more subtle than that, which is just to not really ever say what it is you want to know, but say something much, m much more innocuous. And just think about the language that you use. I'm always surprised still at the number of government people who don't <laughs> think about that. Um, and who will actually use email to communicate, and I always reel it back. Uh, luckily, for those who are reporters here, you know, I think that even though, you know, it might feel like a, an intense time that we live in now and, and that everything's under surveillance, you know, I, I, uh, that's a possibility, but I think, um, I think that really there are still people in the government, and there always will be, who have been in the government for a long time. They've lived through various administrations. They're the ones that are probably going to be the best sources anyway, because they have the t context for things, and they know that um, you know we're, governments change and that the press has a role. And I find that those more mature sources or officials take a longer view of things and are 
more uh, willing to have a conversation. You know, not necessarily about classified information, but there's a whole realm of things that aren't classified that the government doesn't want us to know about. Um, so to seek out people like that who have been around for a long time um, and, and who just have a much longer view of what they're doing and, you know, that every government tries to control information uh, and, and really, I've been, uh, I was initially surprised at the number of people who would still have conversations with me, even though this White House has really tried to keep them from doing that. Can I have a go with this question? So um, some of the people in the room might know me. Uh, many people may not know that in addition to my, my role as an advocate and as an advisor to the, the lawyers at the ACLU, I also occupy this sort of quasi role in, in, the, in the world of the media in that I do a lot of research and sort of half regurgitate information and then give it to reporters who can then finish off the story and get it on the front page. Um, and so I, I acknowledge what you're saying in, in how you report and how you gain, how you sort of cultivate sources, um, but there are a lot of sources who come to me. And uh, so I've had yeah. more conversations than I can count walking around um, odd streets in Washington, D.C., because the, the person I was talking to didn't want to be in a room with any electronics, and they didn't want to be in one place. And, but those conversations have to be arranged somehow. And so while I agree with you 100% that you really don't want to be talking about important stuff through encrypted communications, but just because you don't want to be using a computer for those communications, you need to arrange the initial conversation somehow. And so whether it's OTR, instant messaging, or, um, or PGP, you need to arrange the initial conversation. And, and I'd, I'd much rather do that than uh, get a telephone call from someone. And you know, I think during your career, as probably many of you have gotten phone calls out of the blue from interesting people. And you know, in 2014, a phone call out of the blue is, is too dangerous. And so we, we do need to work towards making sure that the initial contact can be secure. And you know, to their credit, uh, the Freedom of the Press Foundation has, has been pushing the secure drop solution that is allowing um, news organizations to receive that first contact in a secure way. But you know, oftentimes, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna need to have a few back and forth messages to establish you know, which coffee shop you meet at or you know, whether the person's gonna be holding a Rubik's Cube or a, a, a Slinky when they uh, are standing in a hotel lobby. Um, but I think that's where encryption uh, can, can be the most useful. Right, because the problem actually is not <clears throat> that you think someone is reading your messages at the time that you're writing them. The problem is the problem that Jim Risen is facing, which is after the fact, the forensic evaluation that can take place to identify every call and every contact that has been made is going to sweep every person that has called you into some net, right? And you would like the person who you're trying to protect not to be in that net, if possible, right? And that's almost impossible because there's going to be, even if you encrypt the message, the fact that a message was sent between two people, unless you go to pretty extraordinary lengths, is going to, there's going to be a record of that. But I just always think about, you know, deep throat. I mean, the fact that that secret was kept for 30 years is unimaginable in today's world, right? Unimaginable. There, if a determined prosecutor wanted to know who deep throat was today, they will find it. And, and so that is the challenge that we face as journalists, because you cannot make the promise that I stupidly used to make when I was in my 20s, I'm gonna go to jail for you, right? You know, which, you know, you, can't, you can say that, but that doesn't mean they're gonna be safe, right? That used to mean I'm gonna keep you safe. Well, well actually, I don't know. This, this is a great example, Deep Throat, because um, I'm not sure that it would be different. They didn't use, they didn't have email. So they, I don't even know, they didn't call m much over the phone, and my guess is that they did some, you know, well, if I used to, at the height of some of my reporting, I used to call from phones that weren't my phone. Like they were, I would go places, I'd be in a law firm for some reason, and I'd say, could I borrow your phone? So, you know, or I remember, you know, going to a speech and having a list of people that I needed to call from that university. You know, so there are just more creative ways to communicate in a very simple way that, um, you know, and then, so I'm saying that is an interesting example, but. I think for an opposite reason, because they did so much face-to-face. -face. And really, unless they're being 
you know, surveilled in some covert way personally and someone's tracking them, it would have been really hard to find out that, to find that trail and where it leads. I mean, that's the problem. A lot of people I talk to and have not even interesting conversations with, so they would be sweeped up too. So it's a different thing, you know, to be in a bucket of calls that I made or they made to me, and it's another thing to then figure out what those calls are about. So again, be careful in what you say over the phone and what you say on email. Right. So. I mean, it, it, I guess there are some people now who want to start communications encrypted, like uh, he was talking right. about, which is great, but that's few and far between, as far as I know. Uh, maybe, I think the, the problem we're really talking about is that encryption is not common, in common use for all Americans yet. And I think once it, uh, right. if it ever gets to that way, then no one will notice encrypted conversations. The problem is, like you said, that even though the government can't read the encrypted messages, the fact that encryption is being used is a red flag. And so it's a, it's a real catch-22. How do you, um, you know, how do you find like a, I, what I try to do is just a lot of different things. I don't, I don't try any, I don't have any one practice. I, I, um, I probably should have told the people here I wasn't going to tell you all the things I do. Uh, so um, there, yeah, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, but, you know, it's, it varies. You got to vary. You got to, it's got to be case by case. So I want to ask you a little bit more about this because in one respect, it's sounding like we really still live in the world that we've always lived in where if you need to talk to a source and it needs to be completely off the record, you're going to put a flower pot on your balcony. Um, and on the other hand, we also live in a world with sort of ubiquitous metadata surveillance. It does make it very, very risky to have that first contact or any subsequent contacts over the phone. Um, and I think that in some ways, this environment is a part of the understanding that's developed among journalists that the current administration is the most hostile to the press that we've ever seen. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit more about the sort of old school, I guess, um, techniques that you use in your reporting. I was at a conference recently with the SEC reporter whose work had given rise to a huge uh, leak investigation who said that it was her practice to, whenever she called a source, call 12 other people at the SEC and get them to stay on the line as long as she could because she understood that the metadata itself, who she called and when, was going to be revealing. And so she would call people one after the other. And are there things that you do like that mm -hmm. to sort of safeguard your metadata from implicating your sources? Yep. I mean, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's common that people will feel that they're the only person talking to you because you're not telling them who else you're talking to and you've told them that you won't tell them and you're not going to tell anybody else that you're talking to them. So then it, it's, uh, then they feel like maybe they're the only person talking to you and that is, that's a risky feeling for them. So I've, for many years, uh, you know, have said, which is true, you know, I'm not talking just to you, and there'll be a lot of people that you you do exactly what you're saying, uh, and to you know make the trail bigger, make many trails, uh, and I think that's sort of been a standard concern forever, and so yeah, that's. One of the objectives I always try is, if you get to a, on a big story, I try to get to a point where the people who are the sources don't even realize they were the sources. And that they can honestly say, I don't know where you got that story because it's part of a larger mosaic and they don't even remember exactly what they said. And it's, I've had sources who've put out statements afterwards saying, I think that was terrible that the, New York Times wrote that story because they didn't even realize they were the source. <laughs> and that's the end state that you want to get to. And, and 
so that might be really difficult to figure out how that comes about because I think that because of Snowden and the dramatic revelations and uh, portrayal of him and, and also the, the reality of what had happened, of how it happened, that people do think, especially young people who haven't been in the field for a long time, that this is how things happen, that you get a huge document dump. And really, I mean, I've always felt left out from that because <laughs> that's not how it happens. I mean, occasionally, yes, and good, that's great, but it just doesn't. It's yeah, very I mean, much Edward Snowden is not a, together. Edward Snowden is not a model for journalism. Uh, if it is, then we're going to have <laughs> really a lot of lawyers and a lot of uh, problems because that's just, that would be a crazy model. For yeah, I've never met a source who said I want to leave the country and live live in Moscow. In Moscow because this story is so important to me. No, never. In fact, um, every single one of them wants to still go home and tuck their kids in at night and not um, you know, suffer, but they feel there's some injustice. And so it is actually a problem because people now see, like, is this the cost? Because I don't want to pay that cost, right? Right. right. Can, right. can I shift this back to the topic, which is supposed to be encryption, <laughs> um, a little bit <laughs> with, a, with a probing question? Sorry. Um, <laughs> Which is, I have this, this theory, which is that the reporters, the reporters use the tools that are available to them. And that while, I mean, you all are spectacular reporters in your own areas, and you use the skills that you have. Right. But I, I suspect that, you know, given that, it, that many of these tools are so difficult, and given that, I mean, in Julia's case, you had to teach us this yourself how to use these tools, right? And well, it, you helped me. But well, you, you, got, you sought people out to help right. you, but you didn't get any, like, official support from your employer. If anything, it was the opposite. Yeah, that would be we, the opposite. Right? Yeah, at the oh, New York really? Times, we now, I mean, I've, we've, I use encryption on, in various ways. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to get into the details. And we have people at the Times, technology people, who now help you with that. And right, I'm just saying that now. it's not, yes. Yeah. Right, so, so what I want to ask is, traditionally, did you get any support? And, it, and, and so my, my hypothesis is that maybe this is a, this is a, a new thing at the Times, but I, I suspect that at most media organizations, you know, you, the IT department gives you a laptop on your first day and they give you your desk phone, but they don't hook you up with encryption software. And so, you know, in, in that regard, you know, First right. Look Media, you know, which has a, a team of skilled security engineers who are bumping fists over there, um, <laughs> uh, they... Uh, <laughs> You know, they teach their reporters how to use encryption. They walk them through the process of sending their first encrypted email and then shout at them when they make, make a mistake. Um, you know, I, I suspect that most news organizations just don't offer that degree of support. And so I'm, I'm not blaming no, you for you're really, encryption. No, you're really, you're right. I'm saying, I'm, I'm asking, is, is it possible that one of the reasons why you resort to the, like, cloak and dagger uh, meeting in the garage is because no one has ever spent, you know, sat you down and given you the training and tools to do this. Or if you are now using encryption, it's just, it, the reason is because it just recently happened that you started getting this institutional support. Chris, let me interject. Do you think that the kinds of tools that First Look is providing to its journalists are a sort of industry-wide best practice that needs to be imitated across the board? Yes. I mean, I, I think that every organization should have Every news organization should have a chief security officer, and, and that role should re involve more than just setting up the organization's firewall. I, mean, I think that you're setting up like a false dichotomy, though, because the truth is mm -hmm. that the cloak and dagger meeting in the garage is why we got it. That is the ultimate goal. That's why we got into journalism. That is the only thing we want out of this. I encryption is only a tool to get to that ultimate goal, right? Because ultimately, it's very hard to verify any information that you get. So it's just, a, as you said, it's a first step, right? But in terms of how to get there, there's many routes. But I would say this, that most news organizations that I understand, they don't offer you any guidelines on how to set up a cloak and dagger meeting offline <laughs> or encrypted, right? I mean, there's, it's not a, um, these organizations or everyone has their own technique. It's not a, most places don't have training on like reporting techniques. But they have social media guidelines, right? So if they have social media guidelines and, and emails from management saying this is how often we want you to tweet and this is, you know, this is how you manage your presence online, they should be doing the same. I mean, I argue they should be doing the but same. But you've obviously never period. worked at one of these organizations where <laughs> nobody does what they're told all the time. So. Well, but I, I think the, uh, you're making a really good point if I want to just turn it just slightly, which is 
Like the Post and the Times and other big organizations have now more sophisticated uh, security and security people that can help us when we need it. And, you know, our system in general, they've done things to keep certain reporter who, reporters who, who they know are going to have these issues. They, they are, they've created systems to keep our communications more secure. It's not, you know, anywhere where you're suggesting it be. But I would imagine that most people who work at other c smaller places or are freelancers uh, or do, you know, a lot of the consortium, international consortium work, don't have the apparatus behind them that we have. And therefore, you know, what you what you have to teach and what other people here today at the conference have, have to teach is very valuable. And I can rely on, you know, my technologists at the post to help me when I need it. So yeah, I'm that, really that. not trying to discourage any of this. I'm just saying, you know, it has its place but let's not forget how most actual reporting, especially when you're dealing with the government, comes through and that there's a psychology about source building that is antithetical to using encryption, uh, which you know Jim has just yeah, described. Yeah, I've been trained on all the major encryption things from, uh, I think they now have pretty good people at the New York Times. They're not the normal IT people. Uh, and. No offense. But it is, like Dana said, it's a, it's a tool. And it's, um, it's something to use in, when it's appropriate. It's not, uh, in, it's not an end-all, be-all for how do you do reporting. And um, I guess that's the only point we were trying to make, is you still got to, I mean, it's a, it, if you, I have um, found it useful in some circumstances for communications. And I have used it and continue to use it, but it's, um, but then there's other occasions where you don't, and you just have to meet people in person, and never. Um, I mean, for instance, there are times when you just meet meet people before you, there's any email trail at all, and um, we never have any electronic communications with them at all ever. And um, those are the people that I really want to keep safe. And I don't trust uh, any electronic communications in certain circumstances. So wh when you go to a restaurant and you go to the bathroom and you see that the bathroom is disgusting, like that's an indicator that, that the kitchen probably is pretty bad too. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I don't get to go into the newsrooms and see what's happening inside there and see what tools the reporters are using. But if you look, the, in, in my eyes, the encryption bathroom of, of media uh, are, the, are their websites. And the, the news website, the, or, the websites of many of the major news organizations, not only do they not use basic encryption that would protect the privacy of their readers, but because of their desire to make money, they're you know, packed with tracking cookies. Every major news site is tracking its visitors and allowing third parties to see which articles you're reading. Now, to their credit, the, the CTO of the New York Times uh, recently laid down the gauntlet and challenged all of the other major American news organizations to deploy a, a HTTPS encryption by 2015. Um, but we're still not there yet. You know, it's, it's a week now since we learned that the FBI impersonated the Associated Press. You know, how much more is it going to take? Uh, for the, n the news media and this community to recognize not only that encryption protects the, c the confidentiality of your communications, but it provides integrity too. And people need to be able to trust that they are actually visiting the New York Times or the AP or the ProPublica website. And right now, there isn't anything that regular re readers can use to verify where the news they're reading actually comes from. And so I'm, I'm glad the New York Times is moving in that direction, and I'm, I'm glad that First Look and Vice and a few other scrappy outlets, you know, sort of beat them to it. Uh, but part of the, you know, part of the encryption process is, is more than just protecting your sources. It's also about protecting your readers. And right now, every all the big all the big news organizations are letting their readers down. So I'm going to open it up to some audience questions, if there are any. Um, there should be audience mics somewhere. But I can also just be loud. You could be loud, yeah. Hi, Elijah Friedman. I, I freelance full time, so uh, thank you for raising that point. Um, Rich Thomas asks, do you think the issue is speaking to probably more of a financial one? I mean, do news newspapers are not worried about money for their reporters, let alone more advanced security and forcing it made? So I guess my question is if there's like three things you can do as a reporter, you know, to be, be better in this arena of protect your sources, like what would they be? 
I mean, freelancers always get screwed. You, you know, if you go out into, the, into a war zone and you get PTSD, there's not going to be anyone who's going to be paying your, your medical bills. If, if you get shot, there's not going to be anyone who's, who's yeah. helping you. So in, in 2011, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in which I called for the news media community to take digital security seriously. This was you know, two years before Snowden came on the scene. Uh, I, I think that the organizations that have the budgets need to be putting some of those, those budgets into security. I think that the journalism uh, academic community, journalism schools need to be including digital security in their basic curriculum and not just elective courses that some students could take. Uh, I, I know there are sort of slow movements in that area by a few schools, but this needs to be the norm, not the exception. Uh, and then I think that major foundations like the Knight Foundation really need to step forward and put serious money into this. I, I know that Knight has, has given some initial grants in some areas, but this needs to be a major line of funding for Knight and then other foundations to, su to support the creation of easy to use tools. You know, the, the tools that Julia mentioned, Tails, OTR, and PGP, are laughably difficult to use. I mean, it is tragic as to how, how bad they are. The number of times I've had people send me their private keys by mistake instead of their public keys. I, I mean, and right. I, I've had this happen from reporters, from lawyers, from the lay public, from computer scientists who make mistakes. I mean, these tools are really difficult to use. And, you know, it, the skills required to design secure software are not the same skills as that are required to build usable software. Uh, and the fact is there just aren't a lot of people with usability expertise who donate their time to these projects. These are largely community supported projects. In, in addition to you know, creating resources for their own reporters, news organizations need to also contribute to this sort of this, this community pool of tools. We need to have you know, one New York Times reporter, uh, a programmer, one ProPublica reporter contributing patches to PGP and to OTR and, the, and Tails. And you know, these organizations need to be funding you know, five or $10,000 uh, improvements uh, to make these tools better because everyone is relying on these tools and none of the major organizations that are actually benefiting them from them are actually contributing to their development. Can I just answer the question? Um, so the three things that um, you should do are you should download the Tor browser and just use that for whenever you're searching for things that you just keep it in your arsenal so that you know when you're on Tor you're anonymous mostly, your address is masked. So do that. Get, um, if, if you're on Windows, download Pigeon. It's the OT, it's the off-the-record instant messaging service. And if you're on Mac, download Adium, which is the off-the-record instant messaging service, and use it. You can plug your Gmail chat right into it. It's just a way to encrypt your existing instant messaging. And the third thing is, I hate to say it, but you get a PGP key. It's terribly painful. and. Um, <laughs> But it's really important because it actually brings sources to you. What you do is you need to get a key and post the public key fingerprint on your website or somewhere that people can see it. And then sources will come to you, right, because they can find a way to send you an encrypted message. And they can actually work to mask the metadata on their end. Not very effectively. But there is some hope that they, somebody will reach out to you. And that I have found is very um, lucrative. I get lots of PGP sources all the time. Can I just reiterate, though, what Chris said in a different way? I teach now uh, <clears throat> at the University of Maryland, and I have this class on journalism and peril, and each student has to profile a journalist who's imprisoned overseas, a foreign journalist. So some of them wanted to communicate with uh, their family members or their lawyers or even try them. And so that's where, in my mind, you know, really the question came up, well, how are we going to do that in a safe way? So we have this very well-funded computer science department over there, and I got somebody to come and do a lesson on encryption and think through how they would do this. And these are you know, young people who use all this stuff, not that stuff, but use electronics all the time. And so they were very enthusiastic, but at the end, they were very like, God, this is hard. So they, a couple of them were trying to use it and learn it and get f fluid at it. And <coughs> what you're saying, the th why is this technology so hard? It needs to be better. It needs to be easier. And the you know, departments like that and others and news organizations need to create a different technology that's easier to use because it's just too hard right now. 
Can I just add a slight plug for um, this week? Um, I worked in collaboration with the EFF to put together a rating of encryption tools. And we actually rated uh, 40 tools on the metrics of how secure they were, not how usable they were, but how secure they were. Did they meet the minimum standards of encryption? Because actually, some tools that people think are safe, like Skype, are not actually. And so we. Um, we, we actually found that the ones that did really well on these ratings, also some of them are very usable. There's a lot of new apps that you can just put on your phone. So text secure, for instance, is encrypted texting. Um, and you can, and if the other person gets it, it's just an app. It's like installing any other app. It is super easy and you can have secure texting with somebody. Um, encrypted text, same thing with phone calling. There's some silent phones, red phone. So we actually put out this list and there are new tools coming on the market. And it's incumbent, one reason I did this story is I wanted to encourage this, because I want people to make the right choices for secure tools, but also to choose usable tools. And I think the EFF is gonna continue to um, rate tools as they come on the market. Yeah, I just wanna also just say, I, I wanna say, encourage the people who are trying to do this, like Chris. I think it's really important that this kind of thing continue to develop. And I think it is really good for the news industry. I don't. I didn't mean to suggest at all that I'm not in favor of all these new things that are happening. And um, I think encryption is important. It's just a matter of ultimately how we use it. And I think. But I do want to applaud all those people who are trying to improve it and and uh, get this into the mainstream. Hi. Hello. Hello. Is this thing on. Great. Hi. Um. So my name is Morgan, and I'm the director of security at First Look Media. And I've heard a lot of discussion from you guys today about using what is essentially free encryption tools, and there's a lot of complaints about how bad they are and how difficult they are to use. <laughs> what I'd really like to see media organizations do is paying for stuff. Like some people here work for really large media conglomerates, get them to pay for usable encryption tools. As it turns out, there's stuff out there GPG, yes, it's difficult to use. It's also open source software and it's free. Right. Whereas there, there are commercial tools that are significantly easier to use, that have great organizational integration. And so I'd like to see a focus on actually institutional level, right? Like getting large news orgs to pay for usable commercial encryption tools, as well as focusing on free open source tools, which everyone bickers about how well they work. <laughs> I think we have one more question. Oh. Ta. Sort of following up on, you know, let's say you've sort of set up your basic encryption and you put this key online. How do you go about uh, sort of verifying stuff you're getting over these encrypted channels and figuring out if the source you're talking to is legitimate when you sort of start on an encrypted level? Right, that's a good question because it is hard to verify. We get um, one thing that we have that uh, a lot of news organizations have now is secure drop, which is basically the sort of dead drop encrypted inbox. And we get stuff, it looks kind of interesting, but could it be forged? Like, how do you know, right? That's where you end up having to meet in a garage. <laughs> so one thing that um, Freedom of the Press Foundation has done with SecureDrop is they came and installed it for us, which was great, but also set up a way that we could write back to the person, because it used to be that they just dropped the stuff in there and we were like, I don't know, could be awesome. Um, so then, now we have a way to write back to them and if they can check in and see that we've responded and said, you know, we'd like to set up a meeting, is there a way we could do that securely? Um, because in the end, we need to verify. And that's why I was saying the ultimate holy grail of all this is the meeting in the garage. Maybe one more short one. <laughs> Who's got a short question? Rachel. Rachel Oswald, I'm a reporter covering national security for CQ Roll Call and also involved in organizing um, trainings for um, journalists and cybersecurity. My concern is, is that as we describe these tools, it's really hard to use and shitty and stuff that we are deterring journalists from trying to use them. You know, like I certainly preach to my friends about the importance of doing this and they, they listen, but then like when I begin talking about how PGP is difficult and I like, you know, <coughs> accidentally deleted my key and stuff, I feel like they're thinking this can't, this isn't for me. So how do we get around that issue? I think that these new usable tools are the way, like a good entry point. So one thing that I have found that I'm very 
I start, maybe I overstated my lack of success with sources on getting them to use encryption because the only thing I have been able to get them to use is these sort of encrypted apps. Because the truth is it's simple. You have a phone, you install an app, it's okay, right? Not everybody is willing to do it, but it is a really simple entry point into encryption. And so it's one I would encourage um, people to ask, uh, people who are reluctant to try cryptography to, to use. I mean, uh, let me also note that, you know, I, I think if, the, the, the kinds of sources you're getting are government lawyers who themselves are not going to know very much about encryption, then you know, the, the parking garage meeting is, is probably going to be the way to go, uh, regardless of whether it's initiated via phone call or a conversation at a cocktail party. But you know, there's this entire defense apparatus now in this area focused on cybersecurity and cyber war, and the, you know, the troops on the ground working for Raytheon and Lockheed and Mantec, who are actually the guys writing the next cyber weapons, when they want, when they have a guilty conscience and want to reach out, they're not going to pick up the phone. So if if you want to break the future cyber war stories, you're going to need to have the tools that the people who are writing the cyber weapons are going to feel comfortable using. I mean, I, I've had people reach out to me uh, and and communicate with me because they felt like either the lawyers at my organization or other reporters in town weren't technically savvy enough to right. ensure security, and so. You need to have that level of skill just to get these kinds of sources. On the flip side, you need the tools to be usable enough that sources who aren't, you know, cyber defense contractors can use them. And I think that's part of the trying to ensure the ubiquity of these tools so that all sources sort of as a default can use them without outing themselves. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of trying to you know, deal day to day with uh, individual people. And like I said, I don't think there's any r rules one way or the other. We should just, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic on how I communicate with people. It's just a matter of uh, whatever's the best way for that individual. And as I said, I use some encryption now, uh, and, um, but it's, it's not for everybody. And, and so that's, you just, I think, have to be smart about when to use it, when not to use it, who wants to use it, who doesn't want to use it. Um, but I think it's it's great that, you know, we're starting to deal with this. But I do think that the as long as right now encryption is something that is fairly rarely used in American society, only by, you know, drug dealers and, and hackers and sources who don't want to be identified, you know, we're going to have a problem of the the red flag problem, and um, I don't know how to. I mean, I, I in real world, I don't know how to deal with some of these problems. I think uh, I'm I'm open to suggestion on how to move sources into encryption, but I've it's really hard. Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to go to the second panel. So thank you all for coming and being here.